It's difficult to imagine the danger posed by a fireball from space. But in the early morning of January 18, 2000, residents of a remote town in the Canadian Yukon received a powerful wake-up call. With an update from the CBC's Yukon newsroom. Eyewitness reports say the explosion lit up downtown Whitehorse as if a giant flashbulb had gone off. We were starting to get reports from people that uh, they had heard a very loud boom, had felt uh, like a shockwave. Hi, Jim, what's up? How big do you think it was? They were saying we've got a big event, it's over Canada. And in the process of, of entering and detonating, it took down about a third of the Yukon power grid. I seen a bright light outside. I thought something had gone wrong with the uh, street lights or something because it all of a sudden flickered and got bright. And then uh... Uh, we heard a, a big bang and a flash. Our first thought was that something in the substation had exploded, maybe a transformer. Line one, good afternoon. Um, I was sitting on the couch watching uh, the news. Ah, it looked like a welding torch. You know, it was that bright, eh? And all of a sudden, uh, just an incredibly bright light came in my back window. Amazing. Most things that happen in the secluded little town of Whitehorse stay in Whitehorse. But the blast in the sky that morning got a lot of people's attention, including high-ranking officials in the United States government. There's a lot of political problems at stake, if this is a natural event or if it's a man-made event. And so you want to know that right away, and that's what I do. And I can't tell you how many there are or where they are, but I can tell you that the Department of Defense operates a number of satellites. They essentially cover the entire globe. In the process of detecting the military targets, they also see other things, and one of the other things they see are meteors. Nearly twice a week, a meteor not much bigger than a pillow detonates with the force of an atomic blast. Thanks to our atmosphere, they vaporize high up in the sky, usually. But the Yukon meteor was a little larger. This one was about 15 feet in diameter and weighed over 400,000 pounds. That's a big rock, okay? Just to start with, they're moving at about Mach 50. Most meteors that slam into Earth's atmosphere are smaller than sand grains. Their flash is over in an instant. But a fireball like the one that headed for the Yukon is different. Its size allows it to burn longer, blazing a bright trail of superheated air. 16 miles above the ground, the fireball exploded leaving behind a lingering cloud of cosmic dust. For those striving to know more about the early solar system, this dust is gold. NASA has a high-altitude jet specially designed to gather space dust. Soon after the blast, a mission is underway to gather as much dust as possible before it's lost forever. The plane has collectors under the wings that can be opened mid-flight. Inside each collector is a sterilized plate coated with a sticky oil to collect the dust. It's a million dollar sheet of flypaper. But for scientists chasing a fireball, it's often the only hope of recovering anything from a meteor. For all their high-tech tools, no dust is recovered over the Yukon. It's up to one man, with nothing more than a keen sense of the terrain, to find out if fragments of the fireball made it to Earth. Outdoorsman Jim Brook hears the news report and heads out to Tagish Lake. I knew that if, if there was anything to be found, the best chance would probably be traveling on the lake. I had nobody at that time had a clear idea of exactly where it would have come down. When I found them, it was getting oh, close to dark. It was already dark enough that I had the headlights on, and actually I drove by quite a few of them before I actually saw them. 
because most of them were small pieces about this size and the ones I first saw were about this size. That's like a charcoal briquette sitting on top of a snowdrift. I stopped and got out and checked them out because there was no other obvious reason for anything being out there. Finding a meteorite is rare, but to find several on ice, their cosmic contents still frozen is exceptional. Jim Brooks' decision to pick them up using plastic bags on his hands capped this one-of-a-kind event. It's, it's an odd experience. And you're in the midst of all these billions of tons of terrestrial rocks and geology, and then you find this thing that is not from the planet. It's a, it's a strange feeling. The Yukon Space Rocks would soon take another trip to one of the safest and most sanitary places on Earth, the Class 10 clean room at Johnson Space Center in Texas. Space rocks gain immediate access. Humans have to go through an elaborate sanitation process just to enter the room. Cosmic mineralogist Mike Zelensky gets a lot of rocks sent his way. Not all of them turn out to be from space. It was only when the samples came down, I opened them up in the laboratory, that we realized that they really were meteorites. And not only that, but were an extremely rare kind of meteorite, perhaps the oldest, most primitive of, of all that we have. It, it appears to contain a very high concentration of stardust, the original material from which all the plants and the sun were formed from, our, all the atoms in our bodies came from stardust. And so to have it be recovered like that immediately and still frozen is really a once in a, in a you know, century sort of an event. Could a few crumbling rocks actually have something to tell us about the building blocks that created the solar system? Asteroids, comets, and meteors may offer us a way to go back in time. Everything in the solar system formed 4.5 billion years ago. The result of impacts and collisions on the grandest scale. While nine planets emerged, trillions of smaller chunks of debris remained loose outside the orbit of Mars because of Jupiter's tremendous gravitational pull. This is the asteroid belt. Leftovers from creation, they are today capable of massive destruction. Well, our solar system is not just the sun and the nine planets that we've all been taught since grade school. There's also thousands, millions of comets and asteroids out there, the so-called small bodies of the solar system. They not only represent the, the chemical mix from which the solar system formed, uh, they also have a nasty habit of running into it from time to time. The same mechanism that didn't allow them to form into a single planet because of uh, neighboring Jupiter picks them into Earth-crossing orbits. In a very real sense, we will get hit. Uh, it's not a question of if, it's just a question of when. Astronomers have already found 500 Earth-crossing asteroids, half a mile or larger. A space rock as large as the one that ended the dinosaurs is out there and can hit us again. In 1994, astronomers got a rare chance to witness this danger. An enormous comet named Shoemaker-Levy 9 broke into 20 pieces and was sucked into Jupiter at speeds 100 times faster than a bullet. Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 causes an explosive event that is roughly equivalent to a Hiroshima-type blast going off every second for 13 years. It caused a dust cloud that was far bigger than the Earth itself, and so people could understand that if a comet or an asteroid of that size were to hit Earth, uh, there'd be serious trouble. Understanding fireballs becomes a matter of global security. A spacecraft called Near Shoemaker is launched to rendezvous with one of these marauders. An asteroid called Eros, orbiting out by Mars. Sometime in the next few million years, Eros and the Earth could collide. 
or many kind of natural disasters you can't do anything about. An earthquake happens, it happens. But if an asteroid's headed toward you, we have the, the technology in principle, never been tested, but in, in theory we've got rockets, we've got bombs, uh, they're strong enough and powerful enough that one might be able to uh, apply that force to cause the asteroid's orbit to change just slightly so that it misses the Earth instead of hits the Earth. And the kind of measurements we've been doing on near Shoemaker are at least a start in that direction. In fact, the near mission is well past the starting point. It's taken five years, two and a half trips around the sun, and two billion miles to get there. But this tough little spacecraft arrives and is now orbiting the asteroid Eros. Its primary mission was to take the first close-up pictures of a small celestial body. But today, the mission takes a dramatic and historic turn. NASA will attempt to land the spacecraft on the asteroid itself. By their own admission, it's exceedingly risky. They are attempting to maneuver a craft orbiting an asteroid 190 million miles from Earth. We're the first spacecraft to ever orbit a small body. And now I'm hoping we will also be the first spacecraft to land on a small body. What I don't want to be is the first, is the first impactor on a small body. Uh, that is one that hits rather hard. Uh, Eric, going to be here. Overseeing the entire project from the Applied Physics Laboratory near Baltimore, Maryland, is Mission Director Robert Farquhar. We've been going through this over and over again, and I'm just thinking of all the places where the thing can fail, and there's an awful lot of places because the uh, round trip light time is like 35 minutes. So by the time we find out there's a problem and then think of what to do, it's going to be too late. I like that. Uh, uh, how much higher do you think it'll be? Well, it's not one to one, and, and because the screw away the... Uh... Chief Navigator Bobby Williams assists Farquhar across the country at the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. I had to spread them out. For the near mission, we, we essentially had to rewrite the book on the way we do things uh, and missions to planets. Uh, we have quite a bit of knowledge about the planet before we get there, but for asteroids, we know almost none of those things to the precision we need to navigate spacecraft around them. Well, so all, the this, this is all of the orbiters that have flown to date have flown around, uh, in Lamont's term, a, a ball. This is uh, more like a potato. Deep space navigators typically use the uniform gravity around a planet to hold a ship on course. But everything about this wobbling potato seems intent on throwing them off. Uh, this is new. <laughs> I haven't done anything like this before. <laughs> I've been working here for 33 years. <laughs> the ir irregular shape causes uh, a lot of problems in terms of uh, navigation. And then the, with that goes the, an irregular gravity field. When the spacecraft orbits around or tries to land, it's, it's buffeted by these, by these different uh, regions of Eros. This buffeting, or gravitational pull on the spacecraft, can be put to use by scientists to find out how dense an asteroid is. Eros seems to be a solid asteroid with unusual cracks in its interior. Suggesting that at some point, Eros was chipped from a larger asteroid during an impact. Just how diverse these space rocks can be was revealed by an earlier pass-by of asteroid Matilde. When Nier received a gravity jiggle, scientists were surprised to learn that this asteroid wasn't solid at all. If this thing were a little bit lighter, it would float. That's hardly a whirling rock type analogy. So then we had to revise our thinking that how do you get an object that's so huge uh, and yet is so under dense? And the answer, I think, is that it's a rubble pile. It's not solid rock, it's bits and pieces of rock held together with little more than their own self-gravity with a lot of interior voids. It has enormous craters on it. 
we thought that there was a maximum size of crater you could have on an asteroid that if there were an impact that would make a bigger, a bigger crater, it would blast the thing apart. And this not only has one crater that's bigger than we thought was possible, it has about five of them. Orbiting close to Eros, Nier's camera records the violent nature of the solar system in staggering detail. This 21-mile hulk lies battered and scarred. 100,000 craters. Accumulations of impact debris possibly 100 feet deep. For the first time, we've come face to face with a natural enemy of Earth. And this one is three times larger than the rock that killed the dinosaurs. As images stream down from near day and night, 160,000 of them so far, mission planners are hatching one final, daring maneuver to get the closest look yet at the asteroid. That if the station loses lock, it's not going to be able to lock up very fast. Is that the problem? What they're going to do next may push it well beyond what the spacecraft can handle. They plan to bring the craft without any landing gear to the surface of Eros itself, taking pictures the whole way. It looks like maybe we're a little bit, a little bit further to the left, but still about like... The uh, near Shoemaker spacecraft and the mission was designed to orbit an asteroid, and this is already a big step forward. And so we didn't want to bite off too much with the first mission. Otherwise, we would have put landing gear on it, and we would have had uh, the capability to land on the asteroid. But uh, even before we launched, I was already thinking, hey, it'd be a nice way to end the mission. Non-burn predict, they changed the AOS to 1620. Yes, sir. So if it all works, we should hit between 2 and 7 miles per hour. And in order to slow it down, we need a whole series of engine burns uh, to go off one after the other in a very precise way. Uh, but uh, once it's gone off, and it's, if it's not done right, uh, there's not too much we can do to uh, save the spacecraft from crashing. The odds are long, but it's worth the risk. What's learned here could save our planet if an asteroid is headed our way. Sometimes the sky does fall. On the night of October 9, 1992, Fans at a football game are distracted. So are amateur videographers in two other mid-Atlantic states. It's known as the Peekskill Fireball. That's because it finally came to rest on a Chevy Malibu in Peekskill, New York. The chances of getting hit by one are rare, but the Earth is a target. We have only to look at the moon. The view is filled with craters. Without an atmosphere, many more impacts occur. Even lunar dust is pitted with micro-impacts. And it's all there, preserved. It's not possible that the Earth has escaped being hit by fireballs. But on the Earth, everything recycles, it changes and within 3 million, 10 million years. And as a result, um, it's very difficult to find impact craters. They get buried, they get eroded, they get destroyed. Impact specialist Peter Schultz is trying to find traces of an impact on the coast of Argentina. This area is made up like a giant sandbox and as a result, when the crater forms, it fills in. So it's, it's much more difficult to find the crater in this type of environment. Craters are so hard to find, Schultz often works like a detective, sorting through tiny clues. While in Argentina, an intriguing piece of evidence came to him completely by chance. It's, it, I think it's a real lesson in listening to somebody who just asked a very simple question. Her name was Fernanda. Uh, she was translating some presentations I was giving 
in, in Cordoba and Rio Cuarto. She came to me with some beautiful small green glasses and said, are these somehow related? She got them when she was a five-year-old or seven-year-old walking along the cliffs of Argentina. And, and here, 20 years later, she was showing these glasses to me. Um, unless we could find more of it, this would be just an anecdote, just a story um, of a young girl picking up a, a pretty piece of glass. The road from anecdote to evidence of impact would take Shoals to a remote stretch of Atlantic coastline south of Buenos Aires. But if he is to find more of what may be impact glass, he'll have to scale a set of towering cliffs along the sea. Fernando, golpea ahora. Bien, golpea. Ahora tiren. No. With the help of local paleontologists, Scholz gets a bird's eye view of what the Argentines call escorias. Peter! Yes! What are you finding there? Oh my gosh, it's fantastic! I mean, we've got escorias all over the place. They're in layers, they're in small fragments. Mm -hmm. It looks like we have them. The fine sand in these cliffs has been accumulating for 12 million years. But at one point, it has been interrupted by a thin layer of glass. These are like timelines, like somebody came through with a magic marker and marked the cliff face. So it tells us precisely the time of the impact, and better yet, it tells us precisely the time of this layer that we're looking at here. When we have these dates, we can then put together an entire sequence along this cliff face. Radioactive atoms within the glass reveal it to be 3.3 million years old. The glass is twisted and bubbled, the sign of a powerful impact blast. At ground zero, the Earth vaporizes, it melts. Chlorine, phosphorus, silica, iron, nickel, everything, it mixes, it's turbulent. You know, when you look at this, you can tell this was heated to, to enormous temperatures and then suddenly quenched, in other words, suddenly frozen. That's one of the telltale signs that there was a major event. It can't be anything else. When a large impact occurs, scorching debris called ejecta is launched out of the atmosphere where it's instantly cooled. The impact that hit Argentina could have showered ejecta for hundreds of miles. While the crater itself may be somewhere offshore, another set of clues has emerged, offering even more evidence of this ancient impact. Argentine paleontologists digging along the same coastline have uncovered fossils of some very strange animals. This is the last record of this, this animal. Now, this is a very peculiar piece of bone with this strange shape in here. It belongs to a, to a carnivore marsupial, it's a, which is a strange adaptation. It's a, a saber tooth marsupial. We know that they disappeared. We know that they were not in the layers above the impact layer. And our challenge really is to see if we can detect what killed these animals. Was it the searing impact, the molten ejecta, or the descent of dark and cold? The blast may have been confined to one small region of South America. Yet scores of unique animals disappeared forever. This was the type of event that occurs every so many millions of years. And it's that mystery on those types of extinctions that are on the margins of death and destruction that may be more appropriate for humans to be watching out for. To really understand how a smaller impact can still be so destructive, Peter Schulz needs to reconstruct the impact itself. At the NASA Ames Vertical Gun Range, 
a hypersonic gun shoots simulated impacts from any angle. This instrument allows us actually to capture the whole impact event in just a few milliseconds of time. But then we can stretch it out and actually pretend that we're back in Argentina watching the event actually happen. The intense blast, the intense heat, the tornadic velocity winds. And it will all take place here, inside this steel reinforced chamber. At ground zero, a mixture of soils similar to the Argentine landscape. But can this sand be made to melt into glass? This is a super gun. This is not like a Colt 45. The velocities are much higher. And um, when it hits, it, it just simply fries the target. And it's, it's, it's the only one in the world like this. There's nothing that can get to the velocities or go to the different angles that this particular gun can. Preparations are at their most delicate during the final assembly of the 25-foot gun. The entire barrel must be aligned and sealed tight before loading the tiny aluminum bullet standing in for the ancient impactor. The projectile will be launched at four miles per second by explosive hydrogen gas. This is a gun that operates with hydrogen, and so you don't have, want to have any air in this chamber when hydrogen mixes with it, you could have an explosion. So we have to put in a neutral gas of argon so that when the projectile and the gases come in, uh, we don't have any risk of an explosion. Hopefully, the only explosion will be in the chamber. High-speed cameras will record the results at 500 frames per second. God, look at that. Hey, now stop this in this seconds, now. we'll know if an impact in miniature can help us understand how the Argentine glass was made and how this dangerous ejecta bombarded the region. Oh, my gosh. That's cool. That's great. You can see the bias downrange. That's from the force. Actually, the fireball expanding downrange. And right in the center, right in the center, I can actually see some impact glass. Ah, yeah. The experiment confirms that glass is a sure sign of an impact. By replaying the blast in extreme slow motion, Schulz can see the impact unfold in detail. Oh, jeez, look at this. <laughs> This thing is hammered. It. There's the trail of the fireball heading down into the impact. Uh, this, this is a really hot stuff going down. And then in this next frame, we have this column of fire that is accompanying the projectile itself. And then you have the very hot gases. And these streaks, in fact, are the streaks of impact melt that are heading downrange. Here, right here, is a shock wave from the initial weight that is expanding out into the target. And then it just looks like all hell broke loose. This is just, just chaotic, but inside the crater is forming. Experiments like this show that low angled strikes are especially lethal. A crater is only part of the impact. A line of deadly debris extends well beyond it. And this was the case with one of the largest impacts of all. On the sea floor of the Caribbean is the crater carved 65 million years ago. It's more than 100 miles across. But the consequences of the Everest-sized space rock were global. For millions of years, dinosaurs flourished. Mammals were but tiny animals living unobtrusively in burrows. Then, totally by chance, the rules of survival changed. In the blink of an eye, the Earth plunged into darkness 
then cold. But mammals then didn't need sunlight and green plants. A diet of decaying matter allowed them to survive. Were it not for this fireball, life on Earth would be different. When I walk along these cliffs and I see this record, it actually gives me chills. I'm here today, maybe even in response to such a collision. Perhaps fireballs allowed people like us to evolve. Before another space rock falls out of the sky, NASA has put a spacecraft in orbit around an asteroid. But what will happen when they try to land on it? Back at Mission Control, NIR's thrusters have been fired, sending the spacecraft on its final descent toward Eros. Four more braking burns are preset to fire on the craft, slowing it burn by burn to the landing spot. Okay, this is a critical burn. But the timing of those presets was an earthbound guesstimate. Now that Near is actually on descent, calculating precisely how fast it is falling is critical to keeping the craft on course. To, between here and, and here, we're going to have to talk okay. about what to do there. Okay. To do that. Yes. Okay. They have one chance to control the descent. They can reset the clock on the spacecraft's final burn sequence. I got 0.08% under. The question is, how much? I want to see if it's worthwhile. Is it worthwhile putting minus six seconds in there? Um, yeah, I think it's worth it. Helping the mission director determine the golden number are teams on both coasts who have been sweating this decision for months. The uh, most stressful moments will probably be between the first two maneuvers. They're about three hours apart, and in that time we have to determine what the first maneuver execution errors were and then upload that value to the spacecraft in order to change the second maneuver. So it's a very quick turnaround, which usually we allow days for. We're doing it in a matter of an hour or two. With their spacecraft free-falling toward Eros, they quickly decide to start the burn sequence 17 seconds later. Well, we, I think we got something here. We only have to add 17 seconds. Radioing this command to Near is the last piloting decision they can make. But if they get it wrong, Near will not only crash, it'll rebound back into space. Because of the weak gravity on Eros, they must slow the hurtling craft so that it lands ever so lightly and sticks. I'm really proud of the robustness of the spacecraft and the engineers who built the spacecraft, who designed it and built it. It has to be robust enough to accommodate unanticipated uh, events. And our spacecraft has been extraordinary in that. Uh, it, is, it is a real machine. 20 seconds left in the burn. But like any machine, it'll only do what it's told. The question is, did they tell it the right thing? X-axis. Okay, got a good cutoff. The first breaking burn works perfectly. But to determine Nira's exact location and altitude, a critical series of images will be taken from the spacecraft's outward-facing camera. We plan these images on Friday night, and you have to hope that the trajectory is really exactly where it was predicted to be, so that when, you, when the commands execute to point the spacecraft to the right place, then, then you're looking at the landmarks you want to see rather than black sky. On the descent, Near is snapping a photo every 30 seconds. Okay, so where is this? But waiting for those first images to show up on their screen feels like hours. Oh, I can tell you where it is. I think the thing that's always a little bit scary at the end is that you don't know uh, if a mistake was made. Everybody's human, and we type these commands in, and you know, you, you can type a number wrong, and then the pictures come up black, and you go, oops. Until there's an image, they're flying blind. And they know the spacecraft 
is less than two miles from the surface. Even as we learn more and more about asteroids, there is another, far more mysterious threat in the heavens. Comets. The ancients saw them as signs of doom. And they weren't wrong. Scientists are realizing just how calamitous a comet could be. They look like just a fuzzy light passing sedately across the sky. But a comet is three times faster than an asteroid. Most continue around the sun, burning off millions of tons of ice and dust in a trail hanging in space. When Earth crosses this trail, we see a meteor shower in the sky. One of the most spectacular showers occurred in 1966, just after Comet Temple Tuttle passed by. In 1966, I lived in Plainview, Texas, when I was 10 years old. And we got up very early one morning to take my brother to the airport. The shelling began about 7 o'clock in the morning as people were making their way to watch them. And I was in the back seat of the car and, uh, with my brother and, and my mother and grandfather were in the front seat driving along. And we got on that road in West Texas, was very flat and he was on his way to go be a Marine and fight in Vietnam. So it was a very emotional time for us, very, very difficult time because you can just imagine what it was like. There's no lights, very quiet. And we just got out on the road and looked out and the stars were falling. It was falling, falling, falling. And we had no idea what it was. Just by chance, we experienced the Leonid meteor shower back in 1966. And that was the largest meteor storm in, ever, in recorded history. When there was a rate of 100 to 150,000 meteors an hour in the sky. Jackie Green is still fascinated by comets. Today, she's a planetary scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. Green wants to land a spacecraft on a comet to see what's there. We think it's mostly frozen water, water just like on Earth. But within a comet's icy cloud, is there really something stable on which to land? I would just like to know what it's like to stand on the surface of a comet. What's it like to look around? Do I see hills, mountains? Is there a cloud of dust rising around my feet? And I want to know this so I can go actually land a spacecraft there and help the engineers design these things. So for me, that's the key. Since pieces of comets don't fall to Earth like meteorites from an asteroid, it's led to a lot of speculation over the years about what they're made of. We had this idea of comets as these icy, dusty snowballs. When you think about that, you think of something beautiful and white, maybe a little bit tinged with some dust, that's spewing out gas evenly all over the whole surface. I think on a comet, it's going to be much harder and uh, much blacker. The few pictures we had of Halley's Comet when it passed in 1910 suggested it was a wispy ball of gas and dust. But when spacecraft Giotto snapped a picture of Halley's core in 1986, our view of comets changed completely. We thought we might be able to land on a flat plain of beautiful ice. 
But with this picture, we know that it's a very tortured surface covered in a layer of dust. And we can't tell if this layer of dust is only a millimeter thick or three meters thick. And if we want to send a spacecraft to land anywhere here, we would like to know what we were landing in. If we're ever going to send a spacecraft equipped to grab onto the surface of a comet, we'll have to understand how a comet becomes such a tortured creature, spraying millions of tons of dust per second. The answer has everything to do with the extraordinary journey a comet makes through the solar system. They start out a thousand times beyond Pluto. Out there is a vast reservoir of comets known as the Oort cloud. Stored in this deep freeze are the original raw materials that made the solar system. If you were sitting out in the Oort cloud, you'd look back at the sun and it would just be a tiny pinpoint. It is very feeble sunlight coming your way and you're just sitting out there at just a little bit above absolute zero, so it's freezing. You don't see your nearest neighbor. It's very big, very dark, very empty. Sitting in her own deep freeze, Jackie Green is sifting grains of frozen dust, trying to refine them down a hundred times smaller than a human hair. This approximates the dust grains a spacecraft might collect on a comet. If there were organic materials on a comet, they would be in this dust. Into the vacuum of space, this little comet goes on a simulated ride through the solar system. In the chamber, temperatures will drop to minus 300 degrees. To start the journey, Green flips on a dose of sunlight. In the Oort cloud, a gravity wave from a passing star could bump a comet from its frozen sleep and send it toward the sun. As it passes Jupiter, the sun is vaporizing the comet's ice into a massive cloud of gas and dust. If we're lucky, a comet will pass the Earth by as it circles the sun, leaving a trail of dust in our path. That trail of comet dust may have delivered life to Earth. But a comet, just like an asteroid, could make an impact on the Earth directly. Scientists think that when the Earth was first forming, it was under constant bombardment from space. and asteroids were striking the early Earth every day, uh, huge ones, and that each one of those impacts would have totally cauterized the Earth. But each of these impacts, in addition to destroying life, would have brought more water and more organics for it to start again. The organics and water they brought basically were fundamental in getting life started on the Earth. Vestiges of that early seeding continue to rain down. Embedded within the tagish yukon meteorites, scientists like Mike Zelensky have found further evidence for the idea of the birth of life through bombardment. We discovered in this meteorite uh, small bubbles of organics, uh, hollow bubbles, the sort of thing that might have harbored early life uh, it had it gotten started on this asteroid. And inside of these calcite, you find little bubbles of water, which are actual samples of the asteroidal water. Amino acids, complex organics, hydrocarbons, they're all there in abundance. And we know that these come from worlds which had liquid water present. It means room temperatures. So what else do you need to get life started? Comets and asteroids are offering new clues to age-old questions. Questions we'll be closer to answering if NASA succeeds in landing on an asteroid in space. NASA's spacecraft is in a free fall toward the surface of the asteroid Eros. 
If it is on course, the images everyone at NASA is waiting for will confirm it. If the screens stay black, there's a problem. Oh, this is great. The very first shot captures a tiny sliver of the asteroid. Again, uh, another indication of that. But the next one confirms they're right on track. It's working. One quarter. It's working. Subsequent photos get clearer, giving surface details as small as four inches across. But uh, this is good. I'd say we, we know Eros pretty well. It's a beautiful planet. Look at that thing. We've never seen asteroids at this kind of resolution. Yeah, some more there. I think we're totally amazed by um, okay, the fact really that fresh craters have been completely good. removed from the surface. And uh, I can't wait uh, what the next few minutes will reveal. It's, it's, it's like every time I ride in an airplane, you know, I don't think it's going to work. You know, it does. It's amazing. It's amazing. I'm always amazed that this stuff works as well as it does. I'm always thinking something's going to go wrong. No matter what they're hoping, everyone in this room is convinced that in a few moments, their spacecraft will fall into a canyon. The screens will go black, and they'll never hear from near again. Without landing gear, the only thing that can save this spacecraft is a rocket scientist. This is it. Fortunately, we've got 30 in the room. 18 meters. Against all probability, the signal from near somehow continues to stream back. It's still there? It's still there? Now, we're supposed to, we're beyond 63's end of track. How long can they How far up are, are you guys? Is it possible it's on the surface, safe and sound? Wait a minute, I want to confirm for Mission scientists scramble to verify that the spacecraft has in fact landed. Are, are you in or out of lock? It's hard, we're dropping in and out, but we still got lock. Still got lock, keep, yeah, keep going. MCD is out of lock, we're sure, we have no telemetry yet. Well, the final rating was 0.017 kilometers. Yeah. Still, they're still in the I mean, it's on the surface. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing, amazing. One final monumental image arrives to Earth as they confirm they've accomplished the unthinkable. For the first time, a spacecraft has landed on an asteroid, one of the marauders of our solar system. And if that weren't enough, they continue to receive a signal from the spacecraft at a billionth of a billionth of a watt it's just enough to let them know that Nier is alive and well. It's phoning home. That's right. And it says I'm here and I'm still alive. So this, it's great. This is, this is fabulous. It's amazing. It's fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. This is unbelievable. I kept saying less than 1%, right? Fireballs from space were once completely unfathomable. Now, we're seeing asteroids and comets in an entirely new way. And we've taken the first historic steps to prevent a catastrophic impact that could threaten our future. cosmic dust. For those striving to know more about the early solar system, this dust is gold. NASA has a high altitude jet specially designed to gather space dust. Soon after the blast, 
a mission is underway to gather as much dust as possible before it's lost forever. The plane has collectors under the wings that can be opened mid-flight. Inside each collector is a sterilized plate coated with a sticky oil to collect the dust. It's a million dollar sheet of flypaper. But for scientists chasing a fireball, it's often the only hope of recovering anything from a meteor. For all their high-tech tools, no dust is recovered over the Yukon. It's up to one man, with nothing more than a keen sense of the terrain, to find out if fragments of the fireball made it to Earth. Outdoorsman Jim Brooke hears the news report and heads out to Tagish Lake. I knew that if, if, if there was anything to be found, the best chance would probably be traveling on the lake. I had nobody at that time had a clear idea of exactly where it would have come down. Blast in the sky that morning got a lot of people's attention, including high-ranking officials in the United States government. There's a lot of political problems at stake. If this is a natural event or if it's a man-made event, and so you want to know that right away, and that's what I do. And I can't tell you how many there are or where they are, but I can tell you that the Department of Defense operates a number of satellites. They essentially cover the entire globe. In the process of detecting the military targets, they also see other things, and one of the other things they see are meteors. Nearly twice a week, a meteor not much bigger than a pillow detonates with the force of an atomic blast. Thanks to our atmosphere, they vaporize high up in the sky, usually. But the Yukon meteor was a little larger. This one was about 15 feet in diameter and weighed over 400,000 pounds. That's a big rock, okay? Just to start with, they're moving at about Mach 50. Most meteors that slam into Earth's atmosphere are smaller than sand grains. Their flash is over in an instant. But a fireball like the one that headed for the Yukon is different. Its size allows it to burn longer, blazing a bright trail of superheated air. 16 miles above the ground, the fireball exploded leaving behind a lingering It was only when the samples came down, I opened them up in the laboratory, that we realized that they really were meteorites. And not only that, but were an extremely rare kind of meteorite, perhaps the oldest, most primitive of, of all that we have. It, it appears to contain a very high concentration of stardust. The original material from which all the plants and the sun were formed from, our, all the atoms in our bodies came from stardust. And so to have it, be recovered like that immediately and still frozen is really a once in a, in a you know, century sort of an event. Could a few crumbling rocks actually have something to tell us about the building blocks that created the solar system? Asteroids, comets, and meteors may offer us a way to go back in time. Everything in the solar system formed 4.5 billion years ago. The result of impacts and collisions on the grandest scale. While nine planets emerged, trillions of smaller chunks of debris remained loose outside the orbit of Mars because of Jupiter's tremendous gravitational pull. This is the asteroid belt. Leftovers from creation, they are today capable of massive destruction. When I found them, it was getting oh, close to dark. It was already dark enough that I had the headlights on. And actually, I drove by quite a few of them before I actually saw them because most of them were small pieces about this size, and the ones I first saw were about this size. That's like a charcoal briquette sitting on top of a snowdrift. I stopped and got out and checked them out because there was no other obvious reason for anything being out there. Finding a meteorite is rare, but to find several on ice, 
their cosmic contents still frozen, is exceptional. Jim Brooks' decision to pick them up using plastic bags on his hands capped this one-of-a-kind event. It's, it's an odd experience when you're in the midst of all these billions of tons of terrestrial rocks and geology, and then you find this thing that is not from the planet. It's a, it's a strange feeling. The Yukon Space Rocks would soon take another trip to one of the safest and most sanitary places on Earth, the Class 10 clean room at Johnson Space Center in Texas. Space rocks gain immediate access. Humans have to go through an elaborate sanitation process just to enter the room. Cosmic mineralogist Mike Zelensky gets a lot of rocks sent his way. Not all of them turn out to be from space. It's difficult to imagine the danger posed by a fireball from space. But in the early morning of January 18, 2000, residents of a remote town in the Canadian Yukon received a powerful wake-up call. with an update from the CBC's Yukon Newsroom. Eyewitness reports say the explosion lit up downtown Whitehorse as if a giant flash bulb had gone off. We were starting to get reports from people that uh, they had heard a very loud boom had felt uh, like a shockwave. Hi, Jim, what's up? How big do you think it was? They were saying, we've got a big event, it's over Canada. And in the process of, of entering and detonating, it took down about a third of the Yukon power grid. I seen a bright light outside. I thought something had gone wrong with the uh, street lights or something because it all of a sudden flickered and got bright. And then uh... Uh, we heard a, a big bang and a flash. Our first thought was that something in the substation had exploded, maybe a transformer. Line one, good afternoon. Um, I was sitting on the couch watching uh, the news. Ah, it looked like a welding torch. You know, it was that bright, eh? And all of a sudden, uh, just an incredibly bright light came in my back window. Amazing. Most things that happen in the secluded little town of Whitehorse stay in Whitehorse. But the